this is the second talk in a series that will probably be a fairly lengthy series over time on relationship as spiritual path. I, uh, working, working with the Buddhist teachings and specifically uh, applying them to the kinds of challenges that we all experience in all different kinds of relationships. And uh, by relationships, I don't mean just those uh, intimate relationships, but as you'll see from some of my examples, really just every encounter that we have with um, all the different beings in our, in our daily lives. And I'm going to continue to speak this week about the Buddhist teachings of the First Noble Truth in relation to relationships. And I came across this definition of dukkha or suffering or dissatisfaction, which is the Buddha's uh, first noble truth, that there is dukkha, there is unsatisfactoriness in this human life. Um, And this definition said it refers to a basic unsatisfactoriness pervading all of existence, all forms of life, due to the fact that all forms of life are changing. Um, They are uh, sometimes pleasant, sometimes not so pleasant. and all, all forms of life are changing uh, and impermanent. The term indicates a lack of satisfaction, a sense that things never measure up to our expectations or standards. And one of the Buddha's wise insights was just seeing that that's true for all of us. We often uh, tend to take it very personally, but that it's just uh, one of the qualities of this human life. And all beings uh, want to be happy, Uh, and there is nevertheless this um, unsatisfactoriness and so the inquiry really is so how how do we go about being happy how do we do that so um, here we're looking at dukkha in relationship a sense that things never measure up to our expectations or standards perhaps you can find some resonance of that in some of our relationships Um, and at the same time the Buddha invites us to discover that freedom is a birthright and is possible for all of us. True, deep, lasting, permanent, wonderful happiness is indeed possible. And, you know, we can more easily imagine that 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 kind of happiness is available where in in some state where life is fairly simple or uncomplicated, often we have this uh, fantasy that there, you know, I could run off to a monastery someplace and, um, you know, it'll be kind of, simple and quiet. <laughs> I just saw Susan kind of go like this. And indeed, I had the same experience. Susan and I both have lived in, for extended periods of time, and as has Pat, in spiritual communities. And Susan kind of went like this. <laughs> and indeed, it's the same there. It's, it's exactly the same there. We're all just people, and dealing with relationships is no different. And dealing with dukkha is no different in monastic life than it is in, um, in our ordinary daily life. And I mentioned last week that Chin Zen Yang says that relationship is indeed the layperson's monastery. Um, it's our, it's our uh, arena, if you will, for, for practice. And it can be very challenging for us to imagine that freedom, that deep happiness is indeed possible in this very life. This one, this actual one that I'm living right now, right, right today, uh, not tomorrow when things are better, but that freedom and liberation and happiness are available right here and right now in these very circumstances, these very circumstances, this very family, this very partner, this uh, set of co-workers, this boss, this, this set of politicians, that liberation Full liberation is possible in these exact very circumstances. That can't be right. (laughs) That just can't be right. (laughs) And last week, um, we practiced a little bit touching that that spacious awareness that can really know all of these ups and downs and comings and goings and impermanences and really um, be, uh, have equanimity, have joy, Um, regardless of circumstances. And so our practice, as the Buddha walks us through the Four Noble Truths, is really a practice of 
discovering and understanding how is this possible? How is this possible? Uh, even with exactly this, so that we don't have to change the circumstances of our lives in order for this happiness to, to, uh, to occur. Um, we also considered uh, from last week that these wholesome awarenesses, these kind of spacious awarenesses, actually happen all the time, and we just don't notice them. That we notice them in times of sort of emergency, if you will, but we often just don't notice them. And we practiced a little bit tonight in the guided meditation, just sort of resting. When we rest in hearing, we rest in this sort of larger spaciousness um, where we can see sensations coming and going, and sometimes they're pleasant and sometimes they're not so pleasant. Um, But we can just know it. We can just see it as it's arising and passing away. And we don't get kind of hooked and attached to having some particular outcome. But that's that's a talk for later in the series. Tonight I want to stay with dukkha and bringing awareness to dukkha. And again, last week we talked about the Buddha having the same kinds of inquiries and the same kinds of astonishment, you know, when he saw the dukkha, if you will, in the world. And and his inquiry, he said, there must be a better way. There must be a way to happiness. And so he started to inquire. He started to ask questions. How does this work? And I asked you last week to um, offer some questions, and many of you did, And they were wonderful questions to a person. They were amazing, wonderful questions. And so I just want to um, encourage you to keep asking the questions. I will try to address some of them. Hopefully over time we'll address virtually all of them. Um, But it's that kind of openness, that that inquiry, that is the same as the Buddha's path. You know, where where he was kind of scratching his head saying, how does this work? Um, and so your questions were really much the same way. It's like, you know, in this circumstance, in that circumstance, how, how does this work? Um, so we'll try to bring some of his teachings to bear on, uh, on your questions. I, I thought I'd start with the easiest question. How will I know when to stop, settle, and work with what is instead of searching for something new? You know the answer to that. The answer to that would be right now. Like, and I don't mean like right now, tomorrow. Or right now at 9.30. I mean like right now. So the Buddha's inviting us to really inquire right now. Always right here. Right now. Where is the freedom? Where is the joy? Where is the happiness? Right here, right now. We can notice in our minds that we have so many ideas that it will happen sometime in the future. And that as soon as X, Y, or Z is different, then we'll be happy. And so the Buddha's inquiry, uh, or the Buddha's teaching really, invites us to come right now even, get this, this can't be right either, even right now into the experience of dukkha. Allowing ourselves to know directly in our body experience what it's like to to, to, to experience dukkha, to experience this unsatisfactoriness. Now, that really doesn't sound right <laughs> to our Western minds. Because so much of our, of our Western minds really um, uh, is about kind of covering over the dukkha or looking kind of frantically for some way of fixing it or making ourselves feel better. Um, but the Buddha invites us to actually cultivate the capacity to know directly in this moment's experience the body sensations of dukkha. To be able to um, have some spaciousness around that knowing, 
to have some equanimity, and to have some stability. In part, in large part, actually, so that we're not just kind of whiplashed by the dukkha. Very often when we encounter things that are difficult or unpleasant, um, what happens is that they kind of push or pull us into some kind of activity. Sometimes it's mental activity internally, sometimes it's physical activity externally, where we're kind of almost before we know it, we're kind of propelled into some kind of conditioned response. So he's proposing to us that we can know the experience of dukkha without having that that link be automatic, without being immediately propelled into some kind of unwholesome uh, action, which often the action is. Um, And again, to our Western minds, it doesn't make sense because we tend to think that the, um, that the only way to solve the problem is through some sort of sensory pleasure. Um, let me read to you what he... Um, oh, oh, before I do that, let me offer another question. Uh, here's this, an, a second question. Usually when difficulty arises, my first tendency is to ask what I did to cause it. And that's true for all of us, isn't it? Lots of times, you know, we want to know either what I did or what somebody did, what the cause is of that unsatisfactoriness. And I will offer you a a teaching that was offered to me one time when I wondered about that. The answer to that question is very um, complicated. It's uh, don't do that. So that the kind of rumination or analyses, again, that we're often used to in our psychological Western minds um, of trying to kind of figure everything out. Uh Um, And the Buddha says, don't do that. If there is something that needs to be known, the mindfulness will actually show us that path. And otherwise, much of what we do with our rumination is we just continually revisit the dukkha and actually make it way, way worse. You've heard the teachings uh, that many of us have spoken of here about the Buddhist teachings on the second arrow or the the second dart. I'll read to you, the it calls it the second dart and the translation I have. And the Buddha says that, um, you know, there is dukkha, which is the first arrow. This human life has has painful experiences and unsatisfactory experiences. Um, And if we just allowed ourselves to have the experience of that, we'd be okay. But what we tend to do is get all uh, convoluted and complicated in the second era, which is all the ways we react to that experience, both internally and externally. And so that second era that kind of keeps it going, And we know those experiences, don't we? You know, whether it's just simply a clerk in a store who's rude to us or, um, you know, somebody on the telephone or, uh, you know, a relative who's behaving badly. And there's there's the unpleasant experience, but then there's all the stuff that happens after that where we torture ourselves uh, with thinking about it and figuring it out and thinking about what we should have done and what they should have done and why it's really terrible and why, you know, it shouldn't be happening, that, that we actually kind of end up spending huge amounts of effort and causing a great deal of suffering to ourselves and others through that second uh, dart, is what the uh, Buddha calls it. And here's the Buddha. He says, An untaught worldling, O monks, experiences pleasant feelings, he experiences painful feelings, and he experiences neutral feelings. A well-taught, noble disciple, likewise, experiences pleasant, painful, and neutral feelings. So far, no difference. Now, what is the distinction, the diversity, the difference that exists herein between a well-taught, noble disciple and an untaught worldling? When an untaught worldling is touched by a painful feeling, he worries and grieves 
He laments, beats his breast, weeps, and is distraught. He thus experiences two kinds of feelings, a bodily and a further mental feeling. It is as if a man were pierced by a dart, and following the first piercing, he is hit by a second dart. He resists and resents that painful feeling, and an underlying tendency of resistance against that painful feeling comes to underlie his mind. So he's spending a lot of time resisting and challenging that painful feeling. Under the impact of that painful feeling, he then proceeds to enjoy simple, sensual happiness. Um, he'll go on, but I'll pause there so you don't get distracted. Um, there, what he's referring to, he's saying, you know, that the only way we know of to deal with a, a you know, a, 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 a difficult experience is to eat chocolate. You know, and so we go after something that's supposedly going to help. Uh, under the impact of that painful feeling, he then proceeds to enjoy sensual happiness. And why does he do so? An untaught worldling o monks does not know of any other escape from painful feelings except the enjoyment of sensual happiness. Then in him who enjoys sensual happiness, an underlying tendency to lust, to kind of grasp for, to reach for that kind of pleasant experience, comes to underlie his mind. So he spends all of his time looking for chocolate. You know, all of you know, all of our energies looking for the next, the next, the next. He does not know, according to facts, the arising and ending of these feelings, nor the gratification, the danger, and the escape connected with these feelings. But in the case of a well taught noble disciple, O monks, when he is touched by a painful feeling, he will not worry nor grieve and lament. He will not beat his breast and weep, nor will he be distraught. It is one kind of feeling he experiences, a bodily one, but not a mental feeling. It is as if a man were pierced by a dart, but was not hit by a second dart following the first one. So this person experiences feelings caused by a single dart only. And in other places, he speaks of the fact that that single dart is, the experience of that single dart is impermanent. It comes and then it goes. Whereas if we, so if we can let go of that reaction to it, um, it's, it's uh, a much different experience. So our challenge really is to slow down enough to know the distinction between the first and the second dart and to allow ourselves a deep experience of the first one, even when it's difficult, when it's pleasant, when it's difficult, to know deeply our own experience and to release that second dart. So to slow down enough to know the distinction and, and, uh, and that that really is uh, going to be, as, he, as we move through the teachings, that's going to be um, his teaching. So to know when the stress and tension of dukkha and unsatisfactoriness is present in our bodies and to just be with that, to just allow that and to notice the impermanence of it. I wanted to give you a um, practical example from my own experience of how this might work. Um, and it's a very silly, simple little example. Um, I get um, the newspaper every morning. And uh, we have a wonderful newspaper carrier who should be a quarterback for a professional football team because I don't have the dukkha of the newspaper landing on my hostas or my impatience or in my bushes or in the puddle that forms when it rains. She always lands it perfectly. It's wonderful. So, oh, that's nice. That's good. The problem is she lands it anywhere between 6.30 and 8.30 in the morning. And so there's really no way of exactly knowing when this newspaper is going to come. And so I'll get up in the morning and I have my little morning ritual and I feed the cats and I fix my breakfast and then I go look for my newspaper. And I know exactly where to look at it because she always puts it in exactly the same place. And sometimes it's there and sometimes it isn't. 
And when it isn't, it's unsatisfactory, you know. I wish it were. Because uh, I like my little morning ritual. I really want my newspaper to be there. And as I notice the experience of that, there are a couple of ways that I can experience the absence of that newspaper. One is to see that the newspaper is not there and to, you know, in effect say, oh, the newspaper is not there. I guess I'll need to do something else. And even to allow an experience, perhaps even of disappointment. I wanted it to be there and it's not there. Okay. However, sometimes the newspaper isn't there. And I can watch my mind, and indeed if I pay attention, I can watch my body go into something like, hmm, she thinks she's going to get a tip at Christmas time. You know, I don't know, you know, really I should call the newspaper and I should complain. You know, what time is this newspaper supposed to come anyway? And, you know, the mind going on and on. And you can imagine as I'm thinking these things, what's going on in my body? You know, there's this sort of tension, my heart rate goes up. So that there's this second arrow that occurs. Uh, If I allow myself to move into that space of, if you will, reactivity to the experience of, hmm, today, no newspaper. It's very simple, but it happens to us all the time, doesn't it? You know, difficult things, unpleasant things happen. Can we know the experience of it? Oh, this is what it's like in my body. I'm a little disappointed. This is what disappointment feels like. Can I know the experience of my body without having to move into that second arrow? Now, I'm talking about a second arrow that's mostly internal because I have not, in fact, lodged a a complaint with the the, uh, newspaper company. But we can all know that place where not only is it internal, but then it moves into some kind of external warriorship. Uh, And then we can kind of get engaged in all sorts of tense exchanges and reactivity and then reactivity to the other person's reactivity to my reactivity and all sorts of justifications of internally of myself about why I'm right and I really am totally entitled to have the newspaper come when I wanted to. And so there's just all this suffering that can occur that's really secondary and really not really essential. So what's important about that is that to really know how to be with then this this kind of first arrow, um, the Buddha is inviting us to actually know the experience of it. Because otherwise, the experience, consciously or unconsciously, starts to drive our behavior. Unless we can really rest in it consciously. And again, here's one of those places where it doesn't seem right that the Buddha is inviting us to actually feel dukkha in our bodies. In our bodies, not in our minds, not in ruminating in our minds, but to feel it in our bodies. Um, here's what Ajahn Sumedho, um, uh, or Philip Moffat actually is, re- is, is speaking of this. And he says, Ajahn Sumedho teaches that to understand dukkha, you must be willing to, quote, stand under suffering, pointing to the capacity of fully, consciously receiving life as it is. To voluntarily receive the distress of life and mindfully bear it with consciousness and compassion is a critical threshold for spiritual development. It is the vital first step and it empowers all further unfolding. Wow. It is both absolutely ordinary and mystically transforming. This choice gives your life meaning and ironically, it also gives meaning to your suffering, transforming it from being senseless to being a crucial part of your liberation. This is the beauty of the insight of the first noble truth. Philip also reports, um, he talks about, uh, talking about this uh, with his his, uh, psychotherapist. And he notes some wisdom that she offered him. It's a fairly long passage, but I want to read it to you. It's 
from a woman named Helen Luke, uh, who was his, uh, his Jungian analyst. He says, Luke identified, and Philip Moffat is um, one of the senior teachers of our tradition. He lives out in California. He actually is coming here in the fall to talk. Um, Helen Luke identified two types of suffering. One you are to bear, the other you are to abandon. The one to be born, Luke called, quote, essential suffering, meaning the objective experiences of pain and loss. The suffering you are to let go of, she called, quote, neurotic, inferior, and narcissistic suffering. That is your subjective reaction to loss, anxiety, and disappointment. Seen through Luke's framework, the Buddha's first three insights teach you to embrace essential or objective suffering by penetrating it. Essential suffering is the willing, conscious acceptance of the dukkha of being human. And in this case, the dukkha of being a human being in relationship with other human beings just other human beings who are imperfect and unenlightened, just like we are. Essential suffering, therefore, is the carriage for your own development, um, like the ability to bear, like a wagon's ability to bear a load. Um, It is the basis on which you build a healthy and and productive life. Without judging it or labeling it as bad, Luke characterized essential suffering as the, quote, darkness of this human life. It is your willingness to carry the load of darkness uh, that has come to you that brings harmony not just to your life but to all life. Making the radical choice to know dukkha by mindfully agreeing to bear it as your part of the burden of being simply human gives your life meaning no matter how modest or challenged it is. You are being the carriage for conscious life. This is a stirring vision of the Buddha's instruction to, quote, penetrate suffering. Do you not prefer this vision to the standard choice of hardening and contracting that most people take when confronted with dukkha? According to Luke, neurotic suffering is the result of collapsing under or refusing to consciously carry the darkness of life. It is a self-centered identification with the suffering. You are the suffering, and the suffering is yours. Sounding as much like a Buddhist as the dedicated Christian she was, Luke stressed that there is a spiritual call for you to consciously and willingly bear this burden of essential suffering. She did not say it was easy or fun or something that you would prefer to do. Rather, it is a human and spiritual necessity. Jack Kornfield um, tells a story about uh, being uh, in Thailand uh, with Ajahn Chah, and he was very sick. And Ajahn Chah came to visit him in his little hut, and he said, I bet just now you wish your mother was here. You're really feeling pretty miserable, aren't you? And Jack said, yeah, I really am. He said, and so Ajahn Chah said, can you bear it? You know, inviting him to really touch the difficulties of this human life. There wasn't anything to do. It wasn't as though he could somehow summon his mother there um, and to get preoccupied with how much he wished his mother to be there really wasn't going to help anything. Can you bear it? So the invitation of our practice and of the first noble truth is to simply know the experience of suffering and to know it in our bodies, not in the ruminating mind, but to know it in our bodies. To release identification, to release the mind's ideas, how life is supposed to be, and to relax into the flow of this very human life, these very human relationships. The other noble truths give us further guidance about how to do this. Um, Notice we're not yet talking about, you know, don't call your mother if she's right in the next room and you need a glass of water. We're talking about taking wholesome action, but very often there really is 
no wholesome action. There's nothing I can do on tomorrow morning when my newspaper won't be there until eight o'clock. You know, because even you know, there's just nothing. There's nothing to be done. All of that is beyond my control in that exact moment. Um, so we're talking about those experiences where it's just like this right now. Um, um, somebody asked a question about my resistance to embracing pain and a clinging to remnants of pain. And my response to this is, yes. <laughs> it's like that for us all. It's like that for us all. In our path, the teachings of all four of the Noble Truths really invite us to learn how to do that and how to let go of some of that tension, some of that resistance. Because it's hard for everyone. It's hard for everyone. How to be with the difficult in a way that does not engender more suffering. If you read that anything about the Dalai Lama's life and his practice, he often talks with great humility about his own difficulties in this way. I have another example that's a personal example. Um, I've, told, I've spoken of this before um, in another context. Uh, many of you know my mother had uh, a decline and I was with her through many of the years of rather serious decline and um, at the last few years of her life she was in a facility locally for people with memory impairment. And I remember when she was first here and one of the first uh, uh, events that I went to at the facility was a potluck lunch with um, uh, 25 people with dementia. And it was really quite a challenge. It was brand new to me to be with drooling and slurping and clothes falling off and people stumbling and wandering around and saying nonsensical things and having a meal that was really quite, quite strange with a mother who was really quite furious with me uh, for, for having, uh, quote, put her there um, because she was actually fine, thank you. And I remember leaving that day and I was driving down the road thinking, I cannot do this. You know, I, I cannot do this. This is just too horrible. It's too awful. I cannot do this. And the thought came to um, practice in this way. You know, there wasn't anything to be done. There wasn't, wasn't like I could somehow make everything fine or give my mother back her driver's license or... Um, whatever. Um, and the thought came to, to be with this experience in this way. And I had the thought, well, it's an opportunity to learn patience. You know, sort of what Helen Luke and Philip Moffat are speaking of. It's an opportunity to learn how to be with, with suffering with some equanimity and with some kindness and with some heart. And in truth, as you all have heard me say before, it was indeed a profoundly wonderful opportunity. I wouldn't have traded a moment of it for anything. But it was very difficult. So to kind of cultivate these ways of being with the difficult that mean we're not imprisoned by the details of the difficult that we're able to um, really um, just be with what is and do what is needed and re relax and have a bit of a sense of humor about what, what can't be changed. It actually got to be pretty funny sometimes. <laughs> So in your own practice, you might take it on as a practice. I would invite you, as you leave and practice during the week, to consider taking something really simple, like my example of my newspaper carrier. And look to see, what does it feel like in my body? 
And are there thoughts that I can release and just keep coming to my body? What does it feel like in my body when my newspaper isn't there as I wish? When my husband leaves his socks on the floor, what does it feel like in my body? What's that like? And to just practice with it and knowing, um, is there tension? And the clue to the practice there is looking in our bodies and looking for tension because the tension around that resistance place, that can be released. And the unpleasantness can simply be known. And what happens with the unpleasantness when it's simply known is I have a moment on the front porch of unpleasantness. And then I go, oh, okay. And I go do something else. It's just a moment. So that we can kind of notice these places where unpleasantness can be simply known known in our experience and we can actually watch it either move or lead to some wholesome action. You know, maybe it's picking up the socks, you know. Maybe that's the wholesome action. Uh, Maybe it's, indeed, maybe the wholesome action is calling the newspaper. Maybe it is. In my case, I decided that it isn't. But maybe that is. But to really kind of have a wholesome action and the key to the wholesome action actually will be, and we'll work with this more as we go through, the key to the wholesome action is can it be done without tension and without resistance and reactivity? So that, you know, if I, if I do do something, I'm not actually going to war. I'm just simply saying, you know, here's a problem. Can we solve it? I want to stop with a couple of quotes. Um, One is a poem from David White. Often uh, there's great wisdom in uh, people who uh, really uh, are are just um, writing poetry or essays. Now David is a Buddhist and so he he has that in in his uh, work. And the title of this poem is The Well of Grief. He says, Those who will not slip beneath the still surface on the well of grief turning downward through its black water to the place we cannot breathe. We'll never know the source from which we drink, the secret water, cold and clear, nor find in the darkness glimmering the small round coins thrown by those who wished for something else. So our relationships at once a delight total delight and a source of tremendous anguish invite us to inquire into this deep mystery how do I be with this how do I be with this finding the gifts the liberation the small round coins if you will that are offered to those who accept the challenge really deep freedom and happiness And a final quote from uh, one of my favorite uh, quotes from Rilke, the poet. And this is an an essay that he writes. He's writing, uh, a a young poet writes to him about the difficulties of being a young poet. And he writes uh, back to him, and this is what he says about writing poetry, but it can be just as much about living a life. He says, works of art are of an infinite loneliness. And with nothing so little to be reached as with criticism, only love can grasp and hold and be just toward them. And then he goes on a little later to say, leave to your opinions their own quiet, undisturbed development, which, like all progress, must come from deep within and cannot be pressed or hurried by anything. Everything is gestation and then bringing forth. To let each impression and each germ of a feeling come to completion wholly in itself, in the dark, in the inexpressible, the unconscious, beyond the reach of one's own intelligence, and await with deep humility and patience the birth hour of a new clarity, 
that alone is living the artist's life in understanding as in creating. There is here no measuring with time. No year matters and ten years are nothing. Being an artist means not reckoning and counting, but ripening like the tree which does not force its sap and stands confident in the storms of spring without fear that after them may come no summer. It does come. But it comes only to the patient who are there as though eternity lay before them so unconcernedly still and wide. He said that his last line is something that puzzled me for a long time. I learn it daily. I learn it with pain to which I am grateful. Patience is everything. It was really puzzling. I learn it with pain to which I am grateful. But I think that's what he's speaking of. You know, it's the pain that really kind of brings us right into the moment, right into the heart of the matter. Um, it says, look here, just as the Buddha when he went on that chariot ride. It says, look here, look here. There's freedom here for those who will look for it and who will cultivate the ways. So even in the difficulties, even in all these difficulties, and we'll talk more about some of the specifics. And, you know, the Buddha has three more noble truths and uh, an eightfold path. So he has lots of teachings about how to do these things. Uh, but the first noble truth invites us to simply be willing to show up and not take it personally that life is difficult and not take it personally that relationships are difficult. They just are. They just are. <laughs> 